Welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 24, Early Athens. In terms of recorded history, the story of Athens is the story of Attica, the region in the southeastern portion of Greece that juts into the Aegean Sea. The entire region of Attica is about a thousand square miles and is considered one polis, making every citizen in Attica an Athenian. Attica was not the most desirable region for agriculture. Besides the rich soil of the Central Valley, it was rather barren and mountainous, but on the other hand, it was very good for olive trees and grapevines. Athens also had the splendid harbor of Piraeus, which could be easily defended. Also, there are silver mines in southern Attica that gave the state a source of income that the other Greeks did not have. Red clay was also prevalent, and it was great for pottery. Furthermore, the Athenians had the luxury of having Mount Pentelicus in the northeast, where they could find white marble that enabled them to build temples easier and cheaper than the others. All of this certainly set up the Athenians quite nicely, and allowed them to be prime players on the Aegean scene. Literary evidence and physical remains show that as early as the 15th century BC, Athens was the largest and most important settlement in Attica, and was a major Mycenaean city, with a fortress atop its central acropolis, and had walls that could compare with those of Mycenae and Tyrants. Athens may have exercised loose control over the other fortified palace centers in Attica. However, Homer does not mention any great heroes from Athens, so it's probable that the palace centers of Attica were independent of the Athenian Wanox. Regardless, Athens does have an illustrious mythological tradition of kingship throughout the Bronze Age and into the Dark Age. They are broken down into three dynasties. The earliest kings before the Deucalion Flood, the Erechthide Dynasty, and the Melanthid Dynasty. We will not talk about all of these men or go into all of the myths surrounding the ones we do talk about, just the pertinent ones that go along with our historical storyline or more specifically, the ones that had the greatest impact on the Athenian psyche. Just keep in mind that most of these men were probably entirely mythical, or at the very best, only semi-historical. Very few myths deal with the time before the Hellenes arrived in Greece, following the Indo-European invasions of the early Bronze Age. But Athens provides us with a very important one. According to legend, Athens' first king, following the Great Flood, was the demigod Cecrops. The Parian Chronicle dates his reign to the latter part of the 16th century BC. He was the son of Oceanus and Gaia. He was commonly depicted as being a serpent from the waist down, meaning he had a man's body, ending in a coiled snake's tail, rather than legs. It was customary for Indo-European peoples to claim a particular god as their patron, as they first developed. So under his reign, Athens and Poseidon supposedly held a contest for who would be the patron deity for the yet unnamed city. Each contestant was tasked to show the people what great benefit they could bestow upon them. The elder Poseidon stepped forward first and struck a nearby rock with his trident and up erupted a saltwater spring called the Erechtheus, symbolizing naval power. Next, Athena offered an olive tree, symbolizing peace and economic prosperity. Cecrops accepted the olive tree, and Athena was chosen. Thus, the city was renamed Athens, and Athena became the city's primary deity. The classical Athenians also claim that the same olive tree survived into their time. Furthermore, the Athenians prided themselves on being what they called autochthonous, meaning they sprang from their own soil. But how did this come about? Well, the story is a bit graphic. One day, Athena visited the smith god Hephaestus, to request some weapons, but he was so overcome with desire that he lusted for her. It was not in Hephaestus' nature to behave like this, and he was the victim of a cruel joke played by the bitter Poseidon, who told him that Athena secretly hoped to have violent love made to her. Well, in actuality, determined to maintain her virginity, Athena fled to the Acropolis of her beloved city, but Hephaestus chased after her. He eventually caught and tried to rape her, but she fought him off. During the ensuing struggle, the lusty god ejaculated under her thigh prematurely. Disgusted, Athena wiped it away with a piece of wool, called Arion, and flung it onto the ground, called Thon, and from that emerged Erechthonius. He was given to the three daughters of Kecrops, who raised him as their own. He resembled Kecrops in appearance with a human body that ended in a snake's tail. When Kecrops died, 
The kingship of Athens passed to a man named Craneus, but he was eventually deposed by Amphictyon, who was a son of Deucalion and Pyrrha. But when Erichthonius grew up to adulthood, he reclaimed the throne sometime in the early 15th century BC, and for hundreds of years, a series of semi-mythical kings traced their lineage to him. The scandalous myth gives an explanation of how the Athenians believed that they managed to be both born from the earth and from Athena. Regardless of what the Athenians may have claimed, it seems that race was mixed, even in Athens, because even though Athena took possession of Athens, they still worshipped Poseidon in the shape of a snake, and he was permitted to live on top of the Acropolis. Furthermore, his gift of naval power at Athens still came to fruition. Thus, these two myths could be representative of the cultural unification that took place in Greece following the Indo-European migrations that we discussed in episode 4. We're going to zoom by the next four kings, Pandion, Erechtheus, Cecrops II, and Pandion II. And the next pertinent mythological king we will discuss is Aegeus, who ruled Athens in the early 13th century BC. Despite two marriages, he was unable to produce any children. This left him without an heir, and thus he was vulnerable to the ambitions of his three younger brothers, each of whom had aspirations of ruling Athens themselves. So he sought the Oracle of Delphi for advice. Her cryptic words were, Do not loosen the opening of the wineskin until you have reached the highest point of Athens, lest you die of grief. Aegeus was puzzled by this prophecy, so he made a visit to Pythias, the king of Troezen in the Peloponnese, who was famous for his wisdom and skill at expounding oracles. Pythias immediately understood that the oracle meant that the next woman that Aegeus had intercourse with, while drunk, would bear him a child. But he sneakily kept that from Aegeus, and instead waited until he got Aegeus good and drunk, and then introduced him to his daughter, Aethra. They lay with each other, but later that same night, she was instructed in a dream to swim to the nearby island of Spheria to offer a sacrifice. On the way, she is abducted by Poseidon, who also made love to her, mingling in some of his seed, so that the newly created child in Aethra's body had two fathers, one mortal, Aegeus, and one divine, Poseidon. When Aegeus learned that Aethra was pregnant, he returned to Athens. Before leaving, he buried his sandals, shield and sword, under a huge rock, and instructed her that if the child was a boy, that she was not to reveal his identity until their son grew up and was strong enough to move the rock, at which point he should bring the items to his father, who would then acknowledge him. This would ensure that he would be old and strong enough to face any rivals for the throne that might await him in Athens. It also just so happened that on his return to Athens, while passing through Corinth, Aegeus took consort with a woman named Medea, after she famously killed her children, to enact revenge on her ex-lover, Jason, who had left her for another woman. But that's a myth for another day. In any event, he invited her back to Athens to stay at his palace. Back in Troezen, Theseus grew up and became a brave and strong young man when he finally managed to move the rock and recover his father's items. His mother then told him the truth about his father's identity and that he must take the items back to his father at Athens and claim his birthright. In order to get to Athens from Troezen, Theseus had the choice of going by sea, which was the safest way, or by land, following a dangerous path around the Saronic Gulf, where he would encounter many bandits and monsters. The heroic Theseus decided to go to Athens by land, and he subsequently defeated six perilous enemies along the way. The news of his many triumphs preceded Theseus to Athens, but when he arrived, he concealed his true identity. Aegeus, who was under the influence of his consort Medea, was suspicious about this stranger who came to Athens, but due to the rules of hospitality, he welcomed Theseus into the palace. Medea, though, being the sorceress that she was, understood immediately who Theseus was and knew that if Aegeus found out, Theseus would be chosen as heir to Athens over her and Aegeus's infant son, Metis. So that night, at the welcoming banquet, she poisoned Theseus's drink. But right before he was about to consume the poisonous drink, Aegeus recognized the sword that Theseus had on him and knocked the poison cup out of Theseus's hand. Father and son were thus joyfully reunited, 
And seeing the writing on the wall, Medea with her infant son fled Athens to Asia Minor. It was almost immediately after this that the events dealing with the Cretans transpired, which we have discussed in detail in episode 5, and thus won't rehash here. Following his defeat of the Minotaur and Aegeus' subsequent death, Theseus became the new king of Athens. Ironically, he married Phaedra, who was the younger sister of his ex-lover Ariadne, the Cretan princess who helped him escape from the labyrinth, and who in repayment he ditched on the island of Naxos on the way home. In any event, Theseus ruled well and made laws that benefited the Athenian people. According to Thucydides and Plutarch, decentralization existed in Attica until Theseus brought the Sinoikismos, or the unification of the various villages, of the entire region. He did this by visiting all of the villages and tribes in Attica and gave speeches to win over their support. The poor gladly accepted his proposals, while the more powerful acquiesced due to his power and courage. Regardless of tradition, as we will see, this was probably not the case, at least not this early, and definitely not by one man. There may have been an early series of wars in which Athens became the dominant city of Attica under Theseus, or a semi-historical character that Theseus was based off of, but there is no information to support that. Furthermore, it is also entirely plausible that in the insecurity of the late Bronze Age, the smaller communities might have felt the need to link themselves together more closely with Athens. However, this was not the complete political and cultural unification of Attica that would be intact during the historical period. In any event, back to the mythology. The heroic-natured Theseus was not satisfied with conducting the day-to-day business of government. He had divine blood coursing through his veins, after all. So seeking adventure, he joined the fateful expedition of Heracles against the Amazons, who were a group of warrior women that lived in Scythia, on the northern shores of the Black Sea. These women hated men, unless they were their slaves. But once in a while, they had indiscriminate sex with men for the purpose of having children. Women were taught the ways of the Amazons, while boy children were either killed or maimed. The name Amazon means no breasts, alluding to the story that these women cut off one breast so that they could shoot arrows better. Furthermore, they were descendants of Ares, the god of war. So for some intelligible reason, Theseus thought it was a good idea to abduct their queen, a woman named Hippolyta, and take her back to Athens to be his bride. This obviously did not go well, and it thus triggered the Amazonomachy, or the battle with the Amazons. Hoping to rescue their queen, they invaded Attica and besieged the city of Athens, where they camped out on a hill near the Acropolis. This hill would later be named Mars Hill, after the rituals these women performed in honor of their father Ares, or Mars, his Roman counterpart. This war lasted so long that Theseus and Hippolyta produced a son named Hippolytus. Only after a long, desperate period of fighting in the streets of Athens did the Athenians finally prevail and slaughter all of the Amazon women. For classical Athens, this myth clearly demonstrates the dangers of social inversion. Good Athenian women were wives who were loyal to their husbands and who bore children, particularly men, but the Amazons did exactly the opposite. Theseus' troublemaking did not stop there. In fact, he found a partner to assist him after he befriended a man named Peruthus, who was the ruler of the Lapiths in Thessaly. Peruthus was set to marry a girl named Hippodimea, and of course, his new best friend Theseus was invited to the wedding. Peruthus also invited the centaurs, who lacked in self-control and became so inebriated from wine during the wedding that they became wild and abducted the bride. This is what sparked the famous battle of the centaurs and the Lapiths, known as the Centauromachy, the symbolic struggle of humans trying to be civilized against the forces of violence and wildness represented by the centaurs. The civilized Lapiths won and Peruthus regained his wife. However, Theseus and Peruthus' adventures were only warming up. Hippodimea died shortly thereafter, so the two decided to abduct replacement wives for each other, or a second wife in the case of Theseus, since Phaedra was still alive at this point. But just ordinary women would not do for these two heroes. No, they swore to help each other find fantasy wives. As it turned out, Theseus wanted Helen, who at this time was still just a young girl. The two were able to abduct her at Sparta, and left her behind with Theseus' mother, 
Aethra, while they went to get Peruthus his new wife. Peruthus, though, unfortunately decided that his fantasy woman was Persephone, the queen of the underworld. When the two arrived, presumably already knowing what their intentions were, Persephone invited them to sit down in chairs that caused them to forget everything, including how to even get up. It wasn't until Heracles arrived to perform his twelfth and final labor, dragging Cerberus, the three-headed guard dog of Hades, out of the underworld, and thus symbolically conquering death, that Theseus was pulled from the chair and rescued. Peruthus, however, was required to remain there forever in the chair, because it was he who planned the expedition. When Theseus returned to Athens, he found it in chaos, at least for him personally. Helen had been rescued by her two brothers, Castor and Pollux, the Dioscori. When the Dioscori brothers took her back, they also took Aethra to Sparta to be Helen's handmaiden. Since Helen became more and more beautiful as she grew up, more and more men sought after her, eventually leading to the Oath of Tyndarius and the outbreak of the Trojan War, as we have discussed in Episode 7. Furthermore, Theseus also found out his wife Phaedra had committed suicide after her stepson, Hippolytus, had rejected her sexual advances. Before she died, however, in revenge, she wrote Theseus a letter claiming that Hippolytus had raped her. Theseus believed her, and he thus reacted rashly by sending his son into exile and placing upon him a curse that he had received from his divine father, Poseidon. As a result, Hippolytus's horses were frightened by a sea monster, and they dragged him to his death. Theseus's reputation slowly began to deteriorate, and in the end, he was forced to flee Athens. He ended up at the island of Skyros in the Aegean, hoping that he would find hospitality from the king there. Instead, the king led him to a cliff on the island, as if to show him the survey of his land, but pushed him off to his death. Such was the humility to end Theseus, but don't worry, his reputation far surpassed his ignoble death. We went into much greater detail in regards to the myth surrounding Theseus, because during the classical period, he becomes the emblem of the Athenian spirit. Because of this, an unsolvable problem remains whether Theseus existed somewhat in reality, or was simply a purely legendary figure, in this case, a creation of the hegemonic politics of the later Athenians. Most scholars believe that there must have existed a very old hero who stayed alive through the tradition, constantly being enriched, even during historical times, mainly for political reasons. Theseus's many exploits were enshrined in later Athenian art and literature. In making Theseus the quintessential founder of the polis of Athens, the Athenians followed the common Greek practice of attributing important events of the preliterate period to some great figure from the legendary past. As Potier writes, if we study Theseus a little closer, we shall discover some aspects of Solon, and of Pisistratus, as well as several aspects of Themistocles, and even several of Alcibiades. However, in order for this full-of-life spirit to be created, the total of the Athenian people had to cooperate. The people who shout death to the tyrants, and death to the Spartans. The people who voted for the reform by Cleisthenes, who threw the ambassadors of the great king into the chasm, and fought in Marathon. The names of the people just mentioned might not mean anything now, but as we journey through the next several centuries of Athenian history, they definitely will then. They are some of the most transformational and or charismatic leaders to come out of ancient Athens. And based on them, Theseus became a symbol of what it meant to be Athenian. His labors, as they were called an imitation of the deeds performed by Heracles, were successful fights against monsters and criminals that threatened civilized life and thus, their defeat made him a hero who labored to promote the social and moral institutions of the polis. Heracles, by contrast, the hero of the Dorian Greeks, was renowned for overcoming monsters and villains as a demonstration of his supreme physical prowess. But the legend of Theseus made him a particularly appropriate choice as the founder of a city like Athens, which prided itself on its claim to have taught the most important aspects of civilized life to the rest of the Greek world. Thus, through the myths of Theseus, the Athenians were able to express their feelings of their cultural superiority. Theseus was replaced as king by a man named Menestheus. He was king of Athens during the Trojan War, but he wasn't mentioned that often by Homer. In fact, the Athenians didn't have a big role themselves, which has led some scholars to surmise 
that this was because the Athenians were not as strong as some of the other cities. However, that belief doesn't really jive with the archaeological evidence. When Menestheus died, Athens passed back to the family of Theseus. Four more kings, Demophon, Oxantus, Aphites, and Thymoetus, ruled Athens until the end of the 12th century BC, at which point the Erechthi dynasty came to an end, and the Melanthid dynasty began. It was named after Melanthus, who was the former king of Messenia, until he was expelled by the descendants of Heracles, as part of the legendary Return of the Heraclidae, later to be associated with the supposed Dorian invasion. He fled to Athens and, according to Pausanias, became king of the city when he overthrew Thymoetis, the last of the Erechthide kings. However, the Melanthid dynasty, which was named after him, didn't last very long after his death. According to tradition, the very last king, not only of the Melanthid dynasty, but in the mythological era, was his successor Codrus, from the Medontidae family line, sometime in the early 11th century BC. The oracle at Delphi predicted that the only way Athens would fall in the Dorian invasion is if their king remained unharmed. So Codrus disguised himself as a peasant, made his way into the Dorian camp, and provoked a group of soldiers into attacking and killing him. When his true identity was known, fearing that the gods would deny them victory, the Dorians retreated from the city. He was then buried on the spot, and the kingship ceased to exist, because the Athenians did not think that they could find another king who would be as noble as him. This is probably a fanciful story. In any event, since the Dorians were driven out of Attica, the Athenians claimed to be pure Greeks, meaning they had no Dorian element in their blood, and went to great lengths to show it. Attica became a refuge for other Achaeans fleeing the Dorians. They assimilated with the Athenians with no divisions amongst them. In fact, some of the aristocratic Athenians traced their ancestry to these people. This influx of many nobles from other settlements, in actuality, is probably the main reason for the end of the Athenian monarchy. Regardless, the kingship didn't completely cease to exist per se. It was just weakened somewhat and replaced with a hereditary archonship from the Greek word archo, meaning to rule. They resembled kings, but did not bear the kingly name. Codrus's sons, Medon and Acastus, were the first two archons. They held the post for life, and it was passed down through their family line, although the nobles had the power to choose which member of the Medontidae family line would be elected. The whole course of the constitutional development is uncertain, for it rests upon traditions of which it is extremely hard to judge the value. But whatever the details of the growth may have been, two important facts are to be grasped. First is that the fall of royalty, which does not imply the abolition of the royal name, happened in Athens at an earlier period than in Greece generally. The other is that the Medontidae were not kings, but archons, and thus were essentially the chief nobles. Archaeology also confirms the tradition that the invasions of the Late Bronze Age collapse bypassed Athens. Still, if the story about the Achaeans taking refuge at Athens is true, they would have found in Attica the same collapse of the centralized ruling structure, drastic depopulation, and the dispersal into small village communities, as in the regions from which they had fled. Athens joined the rest of Greece in economic decline for around 150 years. Sometime around 1050 BC, the so-called Ionian migration began from the mainland to Asia Minor, under population pressures that swelled after the Dorian invasion. The first sign of Athenian recovery from the post-invasion slump is the appearance of proto-geometric pottery in the late 11th, early 10th centuries BC. Although reduced to a cluster of villages around the Acropolis, Athens continued without interruption as the central place of Attica, it is likely that by 900 BC, if not earlier, the Archon, or Basileus of Athens, was preeminent within Attica. A series of rich graves in the Karamykos reveal that in the 9th and 8th centuries BC, there was overseas trade taking place, and rapid population growth around the city of Athens. And new settlements appear throughout Attica, perhaps through internal colonization from the plain of Athens. As the Dark Ages dwindled, Athens emerged as one of the leading Greek cities economically, probably due to its central location and access to the greater Aegean Sea.
Also, unaffected by the land hunger distressing other poles, Athens did not have to take part in the colonization movement of the Archaic period. Contrasting with the tradition of Theseus prescribed by Thucydides and Plutarch, it probably was at this point that Attica began gradual unification, following the disintegration that occurred in the Dark Ages, achieving it by 700 BC. Regardless of how it happened, though, more importantly, by the Archaic period, Attica became a political amalgamation in which the majority of the people continued to live in the communities of their birth, but also as a sympolitea, whereby all free inhabitants of Attica shared common Athenian citizenship. None attempted to declare its independence, as happened elsewhere. Nor were there subordinate populations, such as the Spartan Helots, or Perioikoi. The picture that is painted is of no violence compared to Sparta, who used warfare to conquer the Peloponnesus. In neighboring Boeotia, Thebes was never able to fully subdue the other 11 cities, which is why they were not able to achieve the power that Athens and Sparta had early on. The process of Sinoikismos in Attica created the largest and wealthiest state on the Greek mainland, but it also created a larger class of people, excluded from political life by the nobility. Postmonarchical society was an aristocratic one, dominated by the local landowning power, called the Eupatridae, literally those with good fathers, or well-born. Like other polis in Greece, they would have had control of the best lands and biggest flocks. Also, the aristocrats dominated the government in the form of the Council of the Areopagus. It probably developed from an old council of elders that had advised the king. They met on the hill, or Pagos, of Ares, hence the name, which sat outside the city wall near the Acropolis and served as a source of justice for the state. According to early custom, which we find reflected in Homer, murder was not regarded as a crime against the state, but was concerned exclusively with the family of the slain man, which might either slay the slayer themselves, or accept compensation. But gradually, as the worship of the souls of the dead and the deities of the underworld developed, the belief gained ground that he who shed blood was impure and needed cleansing. Accordingly, when a murderer satisfied the kinsfolk of the murdered, by paying a fine, he also had to submit to a process of purification and to satisfy the Chthonian gods and the Furies, who were in essence the souls of the dead clamoring for vengeance. This notion of murder as a religious offense necessarily led to the interference of the state. For when the member of a community was impure, the stain drew down the anger of the gods upon the whole community if the unclean were not driven out. Hence, it came about that the state undertook the conduct of criminal justice through the Council of the Areopagus. This ultimately led them to becoming the primary governing body of the state, and it was only open to the Eupatridae. We do not know how its membership was obtained, but admittance to the Areopagus probably was a lifetime appointment. As the power and influence of the Eupatridae grew, the power of the Medontidae decreased. According to Aristotle, this ultimately led to several major constitutional changes. In 753 or 752 BC, the hereditary archonship was weakened when its term was changed from life to 10 years. It is uncertain at what point the Mendontidae were deprived of their birthright, and the archonship was thrown open to all the nobles. But with the next step, we reach firmer ground. In 682-681 BC, the rule of three annually elected archons was introduced, and although it's not stated by Aristotle, it seems plausible that these three chief magistrates would have been selected by the Areopagus. Each chief magistrate had their own legal jurisdiction. The eponymous archon held the chief place amongst the three archons, as he gave his name to the Athenian calendar year, and presided over the Areopagus when it sat in a legislative or deliberative capacity, and over meetings of the assembly. He was the supreme judge in all civil suits that concerned the family unit and was the overall supervisor of public affairs. As such, he was required to maintain residence in the Pertanian during his term of office. The Pertanian stood in the center of the Agora and contained the holy fire of Hestia, the goddess of the hearth, the symbol of the life of an ancient Greek city. The Polemarchus Archon was the leader of the army and had jurisdiction in cases affecting non-citizens in Attica. The Basileus Archon presided over the religious practices of the state. 
meaning their ancestral rites and sacrifices, and the council when it overheard religious cases, and probably was a holdout of the old royal family, the Madontadi. At some point after the offices of these three archons were established, six more archon ships were added, called the Thesmothetai, literally meaning those who lay down rules. It could be that their creation may have been designed to counter a growing discontent with arbitrary judgments by the other three archons, who in the void of a written constitution, implemented the law how they deemed fit. For example, we have previously discussed Hesiod's infamous bribe-swallowing basileis. Thus, it seems that the nobles were trying to put forth preventative measures to curb the rise of tyranny in Athens, which, as we have seen, was rearing its head in Sicyon, Corinth, Megara, and other polis at this exact time. Since the nobles were afraid of having only one ruler again, they made it so that these six archons were to divide the many tasks of state amongst the elite. All of these offices together were called the College of Nine Archons. However, it is not clear how the nine archons were elected. Aristotle in his Constitution of the Athenians states that the election consisted of two stages. Each of the four tribes, more on them shortly, nominated ten men, and then the nine archons were selected by lot from these forty men chosen. In his politics, he mentions that they were directly elected by an assembly of all Athenian adult males. Regardless, they served for only one year, and were not eligible for re-election, because the year afterwards they were inducted into the Areopagus. From then onward, the Areopagus advised the Archons and still was the court for treason and murder trials. The full aristocratic revolution of Athens was complete by the mid-7th century BC. Alongside these official state institutions were other forms of social organization that directed the lives of the citizens. From the earliest times, as in the rest of Greece, the people were divided into basic social units. Every citizen belonged to one of four phylae, or tribes. Geliontes, Hoplates, Agicores, and Argades. Members of these four tribes traced their ancestry back to the four sons of Ion. Each one of these four tribes contained three subdivisions, called fratries, meaning brotherhoods. The fratries, in turn, were composed of aristocratic clans, called genos, plural is gene, and also commoners, or the non genitae. Since all the Ionian cities had the same four tribes, these probably originated early in the Dark Age. They probably served as political and military divisions, with each tribe furnishing a contingent to the army. The fratry may originally have designated a brotherhood of warriors, like the warrior bands led by Dark Age chieftains that we see in Homer. By the 7th century BC, however, the fratries were concerned with matters of family and of descent. Proof of citizenship, for example, was provided by membership in a fratry, and in cases of unintentional homicide, the members of the victim's fratry were obligated to support his family, or if the victim had no family, to pursue the case on his behalf. The Epitoria were festivals held annually by all the Ionian towns, except Ephesus and Colophon, on which occasion the various fratries met to discuss their affairs. The tribes also had important religious functions, and the army consisted of four regiments, one from each tribe. These tribal regiments were commanded by aristocratic leaders. The institution of the Fratria was an aristocratic stronghold set by birth and tradition. Furthermore, Greek religion did not have a separate priestly class, so the Athenian religious offices were dominated by aristocratic families as well, which gave them much prestige and a lot of political clout. It was within this framework that the events of 7th and 6th centuries BC Athens unfolded. As the Hoplite Revolution reached Athens, the Athenians began engaging in commerce, which led to a new wealth and the development of a different class structure. The new wealthy people were called hippies, meaning horses or cavalrymen, since owning a horse was expensive. At the bottom of the barrel were the Thetes, who did not own any land and must work for others. They have always been there, but a new group has developed, the Thugatai, meaning yoke fellows. Scholars have two opinions on the name. Some think that these men were those who had enough wealth to own an oxen that could pull a plow, meaning the hoplite class, while others think it is a reference to the hoplites having been yoked together with their shields. Either way, 
The new class of independent farmers has arrived in Athens and will become of great importance. The succeeding decades were marked by a growing class conflict between the powerful elites and the common people. The traditional interpretation of the events that followed goes as this. As we have seen, there was a dramatic population growth in Attica in the early Archaic period. The division of land between too many sons and the consequent need to overwork said land to feed the increasing numbers led to soil exhaustion and a smaller yield of crops. As the population continued to increase in a region with very little arable land already, the poorest farmers thus struggled to produce. It was this lack of sufficient crops to sustain the traditional family farm structure that led the farmer onto the slippery economic slope of the late archaic period. The poorer farmers had to turn to their richer neighbors for support. They then borrowed seeds to plant and plow in their own land, and when harvest came, they would return the loan with food or part-time work on their farm. Aristotle calls these people the pelletai, and it is a catch-all term for the dependent agricultural laborer. This was a fine system, so long as everyone was satisfied using food and labor as currency. But at the end of the 7th century BC, the Lydian invention of money had arrived in Greece from Anatolia. The friendly seed-borrowing way of life was abandoned for something more profitable for the wealthy, as they loaned seeds for an agreed-upon future price of fully grown grain. This made it easier for the poor to borrow, but harder to repay especially with a high fixed rate of interest. But if a pelletai had a bad harvest, or the price of grain dropped, he might not be able to work off his debt, and most likely his own farm was seized. These people were what Aristotle called as hectomoroi, or one-sixth men. They were essentially sharecroppers of what used to be their own land. They had to pay the person whom they owed the debt one-sixth of their production each year, with no specific date set to end this dependent status. The lands that were mortgaged were represented by scattered stones, marking off the boundaries, called horoi. Eventually, many hectomoroi, who had previously found it difficult to survive, even when they had full possession of their land, now found it impossible to live on five-sixths of their crop, and defaulted in their payment of one-sixth to their creditor. He and his family were themselves seized as slaves, called a gogamoy, in order to meet the loan. The result was both the loss of their land too and enslavement by their creditor. Legally, there was nothing they could do, as the same wealthy citizens benefiting from this were the ones enforcing it. Since slaves were not needed in Attica, they were hauled off to Chios and sold to the highest bidder. As attractive as the previously stated interpretation might appear, there are serious objections to it. For instance, one-sixth of the produce seems a very small rate of return for the creditor. A half or more would be expected, which is what the helots paid to their Spartan masters. It also seems hard to believe that all the creditors came together and agreed to a uniform rate of interest, rather than a variety of rates. Furthermore, this interpretation argues that the peasant farmers underwent two stages of borrowing and of default. It would be very naive on the part of the creditors to lend a second time to desperately poor peasant farmers, those now hectomoroi, who had already failed to make a living with the full produce from their farms, even with the aid of the first loan. With one-sixth of their production already accounted for, would inevitably default on the second loan. Finally, coinage did not become a factor in Athenian life until the mid-6th century BC. In small coinage, which is the usual means of transacting business among the poor, would not be until much later. Thus, some scholars do not believe that the hectomoroi had come into existence through debt, but through hereditary serfdom. At some time in the past, the small landowners had voluntarily, or semi-voluntarily, accepted the status of being hectomoroi, meaning they agreed to a quasi-feudal system in which they would receive support from certain aristocrats, and protection from other aristocrats, in return for a share of their crop. This institution may have arisen in the 8th century BC, when aristocratic power was at its peak, and internal colonization of Attica, led by the aristocrats, was taking place due to a population growth. If this interpretation is to be accepted, it seems that it is in this system of conditional tenure that the later writers did not fully understand. In a legally sophisticated society, 
such as the classical Athens of Aristotle's time. The definition of ownership was relatively precise, but in archaic Athens, which had no written law code yet, and a very rudimentary one when it did, as we will see, the issue of ownership was not so clear-cut. The peasant farmer owned his land in the sense that he tilled the soil, as his ancestors had done, bequeathed it to his sons, and retained control of it, provided he paid his one-sixth dues. On the other hand, the local aristocrat also owned the land in the sense that one-sixth share of the produce was owed to him, and if it was not paid, he had the right to enslave the peasant farmer and take over his land. It was probably this ambiguity over land ownership that led Aristotle to say that the whole land was in the hands of a few. Whichever explanation you prefer, it seems that this hectomoroi system worked satisfactorily for a time, but by the end of the 6th century BC, it had become a major cause of tension. The majority of small farmers were not affected, but it was enough of them that it caused a serious problem. The first notable incident in Athenian history was the conspiracy of Chilon, an Olympic victor and Athenian nobleman from the Eupatridae, who married the daughter of Theogonus, the tyrant of Megara. According to tradition, Chilon attempted to establish a tyranny in Athens in 632 BC with the help of his father-in-law. After consulting the oracle at Delphi, he was advised to seize the Acropolis at the time of the greatest festival of Zeus. Chilon, being an Olympic victor himself, had no doubt what this meant. So he led armed forces with clubs and seized the Acropolis during the Olympic festival. Chilon had with him a number of noble youths and a band of Megarian soldiers sent to him by his father-in-law. At the time, the Acropolis was merely the symbolic high point of the city and possessed none of the monumental buildings that stand there today. Although he succeeded in seizing the Acropolis, the sight of foreign soldiers most likely quenched any Athenian thirst for a radical overthrow of their government. Thus, he was resisted by the Athenian people, led by a man named Megacles, from the powerful clan of the Alcmeonidae, who was the eponymous archon for that year. Chilon and his supporters were cornered on the Acropolis, and after a long siege, when food and water began to run out, Chilon and his brother managed to escape to Megara in the middle of the night. The rest of his co-conspirators were forced to take refuge in an early temple to Athena Apollius. They could not be attacked because it was considered sacrilege to do so. Thus they both were at a standstill. Herodotus reports that Chilon's supporters were persuaded by the Archons to leave the temple and stand trial after being assured that their lives would be spared. Megacles, though, changed his mind and stoned them to death when they were out in the open. Plutarch relays another version. In an effort to ensure their safety, the accused attached a rope to the altar and rode down to the river, claiming it was still a part of the temple. That play worked for a while, until the rope broke. The Archons took this as the goddess's repudiation of her suppliants, and proceeded to stone them to death. Those who were still at the altars were then slaughtered. Those who escaped became arch enemies of the Alcmeonidae. Most likely, though, the story found in Plutarch is a later invention. Regardless, most of Chilon's supporters were killed. In a rather recent find in April 2016, two mass graves containing 80 bodies, some shackled, were found in a suburb of modern Athens. The skeletons date from the second quarter of the 7th century BC, and it has been suggested that they were the supporters of Chilon, who were killed during this attempted coup. It's a fascinating development that we will need to monitor further. In any event, these supporters of Chilon who survived were condemned to perpetual exile from Athens, and their property was confiscated. In retaliation, they claimed that the Alcmeonidae committed a terrible religious infraction by murdering those who were suppliants, and thus were under the protection of the gods. So they went to Delphi, who attached to them the miasma, or the curse, of the Alcmeonidae. As a result, the Athenians too perpetually exiled them from the city, and confiscated their property, so as not to allow their religious pollution to infect the rest of them. The Athenians went so far as to exhume the bones of their ancestors, who had died between the deed of sacrilege and the passing of this sentence, and dumped them outside the city gates. They did this because the Athenian people believed that the family shared responsibility for its members' impious actions, might call the wrath of the gods down on the state.
Plutarch also relays that Athens required a further purification, and that a seer and philosopher poet named Epimenes came from Crete and cleansed it. Although the coup was unsuccessful, it is the first sign of trouble in Athens. The conspiracy of Chilon shines a light on late 7th century BC Athens as the setting of volatile conflict between local family-based elites. If we look a bit more deeply into the affair, Chilon was really trying to grab the momentum of the poor people, mostly farmers and small landowners, that had lost their land to the wealthy landowners, mostly due to debts. The coup probably failed because either the people's plight was not so desperate yet as to persuade them to give their wholehearted support to a tyrant, or because they resented a Megarian-backed coup, due to their dislike of the Megarians. I tend to lean more towards the latter. Furthermore, no laws had been written down in Athens by that time. Thus, the land was held by a few aristocrats, and justice was nowhere to be found. If we sum up the two above facts, the Kylon Rebellion and the farmers slash small landowners' reaction to all of this, we come to the conclusion that laws at last had to be written. This situation thus more or less directly led to the Areopagus appointing Draco as Thesmothetes, or extraordinary legislator, to draft a new body of laws in 622 or 621 BC. These laws, called Thesmoi, that Draco laid down, were the first written constitution of Athens. They were written on wooden tablets, called exones. The actual text of the laws has been preserved only by Aristotle in his constitution of the Athenians, because Dracon is Greek for snake, and the Athenians worshipped a sacred snake on the Acropolis. Some scholars have suggested that the priests published the laws of Draco on the supposed authority of the sacred snake. It is more likely, however, that Draco was a real person. If so, he would most likely have been an aristocrat who was in the right place at the right time to take this opportunity and legislate. His laws highlight some of the major concerns of the period, particularly the dangers posed to the community by the conflict between its more powerful members. However, we know only about the provisions that deal with the shedding of blood because they were not altered by subsequent legislation. In any event, his laws codified debt slavery, instituted the death penalty for even minor offenses, and speaks a lot about homicide, especially in making the important distinction between premeditated and unpremeditated murder, which interestingly enough is the only inscription that survived from a later stone edition of the laws, from which Aristotle used as his source. The Greeks believed that the killing of a man was a religious pollution that needed to be avenged, but there came a time when it no longer would do, because it tears a community apart. His laws replaced the family and kin with the state as the arbiter of justice in cases of both intentional and unintentional killings. Before Draco's homicide law, bereaved family members were entitled and obligated to avenge the deaths of their slain relatives, unless the kin could be persuaded to accept compensation. These blood feuds could last for generations, as families sought to avenge a loss, rarely admitting fault and always seeking absolution. Draco transformed such disputes into trials in which the next of kin, backed by his fratry, prosecuted the accused killer before magistrates who determined the appropriate penalty, death for murder or exile for unintentional homicide. Those who were exiled had to go to Delphi to be purified of their sins, and it can only be recalled with the approval of the victim's kin. If a relative kills the murderer, he will be banished from setting foot in the Athenian agora, or the Acropolis, meaning that he was excluded from participating in social, political, and religious life. These draconian laws are very similar in essence to those of the Akkadian ruler Hammurabi from the 2nd millennium BC. They are laid out like this. If X does X, X is the punishment. The laws are notorious for the harshness of their punishments. In fact, according to Plutarch, a man by the name of Demades had said that the laws were written not in ink, but in blood. The laws are harsh, but they were more than likely representative of what had already been customary procedure. Death could be enforced on the spot for acts of adultery and burglary, for instance. When asked why death was appropriate for such a wide range of offenses, Draco supposedly said, Small ones deserve that, and I have no higher for the greater crimes. A broader view, however, of Draco's laws will modify such a negative view about him. As was mentioned, 
He drew careful distinctions between murder and manslaughter. In his laws, we see a body of 51 judges, called the Ephetai. They were chosen from the Eupatridae, but it is not clear whether they formed a part of the Areopagus or an entirely separate entity. In any event, the homicide cases that did not come before the Areopagus were tried by the Ephetai and were held in different places. For example, at Phaleron, those who were tried for manslaughter while abroad and who were not allowed to set foot on Attic soil had to answer the charge while standing in a boat drawn up near the shore. When the shedder of blood was not known, the case came before the Basileus Archon. It is unfortunate that we are not informed of Draco's other legislation, though. We do know, however, that he made it a stipulation that the Strategoi, or the generals, and Hipparchoi, the commanders of the cavalry, could only be chosen from those whose property produced no less than a hundred minas, meaning they had to be wealthy, and who had lawful children over the age of ten. Thus, in the event of their death, their estate could pass to a competent heir. If you remember from episode 13, the Shirtigos was positioned in the front right and usually was in the most dangerous spot of the phalanx, as there was nobody on his right flank to cover his right. Little is known about Draco's life, but according to tradition, he was exiled to Agina, the reason for which is not stated, where he spent the rest of his life. It may possibly have been due to the harshness of his laws and the dissatisfaction of his contemporaries. Regardless, Draco's laws are significant in the process of developing the authority of the state at the expense of the authority of the family, as well as of the magistrates. The laws were the same for both the rich and poor. It was posted on the Acropolis, being available to all those who can read. If you could not read, you had to find someone who could. Regardless, codifying the laws helped break down the privileged position of the aristocrats who had monopolized the knowledge interpretation and application of the unwritten laws. Thus, the establishment of fixed principles of justice limited their ability to shape their decisions in accord with their social and professional ties in a purely arbitrary fashion, which had been the subject of bitter complaints by Hesiod, if you recall from episode 12. Needless to say, the aristocracy did not give this up willingly. There must have been pressure from ordinary people, probably the hoplite class, to have access to the laws. Draco's legislation, though, was not the end of discontent. The heavy-handed legal code can probably be viewed as a last-ditch effort to curtail the spiraling conflict. Even so, it was a stopgap measure at best. The problems that were causing unrest in Athens, however, were both economic and political. Purely legal reforms could not soothe social class tensions. In the 6th century BC, Athens, as well as the rest of the Greek world, would continue to struggle with the proper role and form of government. A generation later, the situation was again critical, and a more comprehensive attempt had to be made to solve Athens' problems. So join us next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 25, The Reforms of Solon. If you haven't done so yet, please head on over to iTunes and rate and review the show. It would help the podcast grow immensely. Also, while you're there, subscribe to the show so it comes onto your phone every week. If you don't have iTunes, you can catch the show on SoundCloud, Stitcher, or Google Play. Also, make sure you're checking out the website at thehistoryofancientgreece.com, where I've posted a lot of neat supplementary photos, maps, and charts for each episode. Thanks, everyone, for your continued support, and I hope you are enjoying the podcast. I would like to give a special thanks to the amazing artist Michael Levy for allowing me to feature his music on this podcast. He transports you to the ancient world, bringing to life the melodies and using the techniques of the past. A new song will be played every episode. This one is titled Ode to Athena from his album Apollo's Lyre. If you like what you heard and are curious to learn more about ancient Greek music, check out his website at ancientlyre.com. His albums are available in every major digital music store, including iTunes, Amazon, and Spotify.